Someone on my Discord pointed me at Matt Heffernan's 8-bit Battle Royale code. So I thought that was an interesting thing to try and port to my homebrew CPU. So this is a quick extras video about that process. I'll add the link to the description, but he did include a GitHub link where he's got all the code here. Now, I believe it's all released under GPL free, so anyone can use it, but uh, obviously you need to obey the GPL rules. Now, I started work with the 6502 version of the code, and the code is mostly split between the main assembler file and um, a separate file where he's been building his uh, fixed point maths utilities. For the maths, I've just used the library that I've been developing over the last couple of years for my CPU. But uh, the core algorithm, I've verbatim imported the code in his mandelbrot.asm. Let's have a quick look at my version executing. So this is my 80 by 60 pixel version running at 4 megahertz. So let's talk about the port process. So look for his code. Um, it's fairly clear. He's got uh, his main initialization values declared at the top. One thing that uh, gave me a small amount of confusion for a while is I expected xmin and xmax to be the lowest and highest value of the display. But the code actually interprets this as um, X max plus X min is the highest value. The max values here are actually the, the range, which actually makes sense when you look down at Y because it's going plus or minus one for the Mandelbrot, which is a, a good vertical range to be viewing in the Mandelbrot set. So his basic test code runs at 32 by 22. See quite a lot of variation in his code where he's uh, making adaption between different uh, assemblers and uh, and variants of the processors. But the code loop is actually quite simple. There's an outer loop that just iterates over X and Y positions and um, that's separated out per platform. But then uh, at the low level, they call this mand get function with the X and Y position. And it's the job of this function to compute the Mandelbrot set. There's a couple of phases here. The first phase is it's interpolating between those X min and X max values, Y min and Y max. Now, because we're using this as a benchmark, it was very important to reproduce the underlying algorithm exactly as it appeared on the other processors. But there are, there are some inefficiencies here, which from an optimization point of view are um, worth mentioning. But it was important for me to write the code with those inefficiencies in place. So for example, here you see the divide by the width and the height, but it's doing that for every single pixel. But the, this interpolation process, you could interpolate X once per column and interpolate Y once per row. So you're doing all of these functions um, many times more than you need to do it in, these, in this interpolation step. And then for width, at the moment we know that manned width is 32. That's a power of 2. And uh, obviously for a benchmark, it's absolutely fine. He's just stacking up the multiplies to make it a good arithmetic comparison. But uh, if you were actually trying to create an optimal piece of code, using a general purpose divide function to divide by a static value of 32 would uh, make baby Turing cry. Now, one of the reasons why I use the 6502 rather than the Z80 version is because uh, the low register count on 6502 is a closer match to how I have to code, but it also uh, makes for a cleaner written piece of code. So within his loops he's calling functions which perform the the primitive operations um, and then the variables he's referring to are effectively contained in memory. We see here in the comments the, the basic operation um, you've effectively got a function here that gets iterated over values initial, initialized to zero squared then it does a range check um, and then uh, it, it moves on to the next set of values by uh, following this piece of mathematics. Now, trying to port this code line for line in assembly didn't feel like the right thing to do. So what I actually did was I wrote a piece of C++ to reproduce what that mathematics was and, and iterated on this until I got it right. The one thing I did find a bit tricky was the finishing case. So I had to go through some of these uh, 
6502 assembly language instructions and uh, look them up to work out exactly what was happening for the exit case. It wasn't particularly obvious just reading the, uh, the high-level code, so I needed to actually go in and check the flag utilization. But the actual size of this function, it's not, it's not very big. It didn't take me very long to get it up and running. The, the real work was done before in just getting my own versions of these multipliers going. So if you actually look through here, you've got a, a couple of divides um, for the X and Y interpolation. Um, but apart from that, this code is fixed point multiplies and you know, the adds and the other operations are, uh, are largely trivial. The fixed point multiply, that's where all the work is being done. And that was the thing that was important to have a good implementation of. So here's my version. You can see a lot of the structures are the same, although some of these variables have been renamed with the ones I used in my C++, but the actual order of operations is the same. It's a very true port of the original algorithm. One thing I did do here is, I've in the same file I've included my code for actually handling the rendering of the pixels. This is actually the address of my frame buffer with an eight horizontal pixel, um, eight vertical pixel offset, just to kind of center what I'm drawing in, in the screen without any extra logic. I also call um, uh, one of my library functions clear to a color. That means it's nice and obvious where um, the Mandelbrot is currently rendering because uh, it always slows down for the, for the black pixels and black on black obviously provides no contrast. So this was a nicer way of doing it for, for visual effect. You will see my code is uh, a bit littered with um, these little sub functions I've done. I split out the interpolation and the Mandelbrot get. They're just called sequentially. I'm not calling anything any less. I didn't use that optimization, but uh, I put them in separate functions just to make it slightly easier to test. And then this commented out function in between prints the values out, which is uh, something I was using to get right initially when I was confused about uh, the meaning of the variables made this list by hand, but uh, I think the resulting Mandelbrot looks quite nice with these colors. I tried to make sure there weren't any sharp transitions in there. One thing I did do is each of the pixels in the original, I output a two by two grid of, of pixels. But this is a pretty quick code, so it doesn't really make any difference. The Mandelbrot interpolate function does exactly the same as before, does the divide and the multiply it in order to, to get to the location. Right, so once again, you see me calling this multiply FPA8, FPA8, lots and lots of times. It's pretty much equivalent to Matt's fixed point multiply function. If anyone's not come across the term fixed point, it's just where you divide up an integer to be the integer component and a fractional component, and then you have to um, fix up the value between certain operations. So after a multiply, you uh, have to add a divide in afterwards, but it's always a divide by a power of two. Um, so you implement that with a shift, or in the case of whole eight bits, you can uh, you just discard the least significant byte. Another optimization that could be brought into play here actually is um, because um, a lot of these multipliers are actually squaring values. If you're multiplying a number by itself, there are some shortcuts you can take, such as knowing that it's always going to result in a positive value and needing less registers to store the input. And so um, I have a square version, which is uh, a little bit quicker than my general purpose fixed point multiply. But um, because Matt used the general purpose multiply, I felt it was necessary for me to reproduce the same functionality here in order for it to be an honest benchmark. Got a few debug functions down here for outputting various values to uh, show a bit of the debug work. Okay, so that was fairly straightforward. It's not a massive piece of code, and so it didn't take me very long, but this function did take me a while I actually wrote this before I started work on this port, but um, I had had a quick skim of the code. I basically avoided this Mandelbrot code until I had uh, reason to implement that for another piece of software I was developing for the processor. But I know I'm gonna get questions about exactly how that function works and how I made it reasonably fast because the inputs are a lot more values than I can fit into registers on my processor. Now it is worth going back and looking at my multiply video. I wrote a highly optimized version of an 8-bit by 8-bit multiply. 
and I actually use this code directly in order to get the fixed point 16 bit by 16 bit working. Now this was 53 cycles, although I actually created a couple of sub variants of this which uh, save a couple of little bits of work in places. But let's talk about how to use that. So the optimized multiplier that I wrote in the video is um, just 8 bits multiplied by 8 bits. And to turn that into a 16 bit by 16 bit would actually be really difficult because I used all of the available registers and there's places there where you need to um, shift and add values together. So instead of that, what we do is we use the optimized eight by eight as a component part of a, a second level of multiplication. So I use AB and CD as my inputs. And then what we do is we perform multiplication on each of the sub pairings between these two inputs. So each of these registers is eight bits. So we can call the eight bit by eight bit multiply initially for A times C. And that will give a result in AB. But then we look at the next pairing and we multiply A times D. Now that's also going to return in AB, but we need to conceptually think of that result as 256 times higher. So we shift it left by eight. And of course, shifting left by eight from something in 8-bit registers is we just kind of mentally renumber what we're treating those registers as being. So we move on and we've got B times C, but this is shifted up by eight as well. And then finally, we've got B times D. Now this is shifted up by eight on both sides. So it's gonna end up shifted up by 16. So what we do is we perform those four individual multiplies interpret the results like this, and then we can get to the final 32-bit result just by adding these numbers together with the appropriate offset. So here we're adding together just A, then we're adding together these two A's and this B, so we've got three values to add together, three values here, and then finally we've just only got the rippled along carry in order to put together B. So now we've got four 8-bit values as a result, which is the 32-bit multiplication between AB and CD. Now it is worth noting that as well as a 16-bit by 16-bit general purpose multiply, I also wrote the fixed point version. So to make this fixed point version mathematically make sense, we need to shift right by eight. So what we actually do here is just discard the bottom eight bits. And in that case here, we can just disregard this byte right at the beginning and not include it in any of the additions. We're also going to get rid of the top eight bits apart from for overflow computation, but uh, for the most part, we can cut quite a few operations out from the general purpose 16 by 16 multiply when we're making this the fixed point version. Now what I actually did here was I used my eight by eight to implement a 16 by eight multiply and then used the, called the 16 by eight multiply twice in order to create the 16 by 16 multiply. And then the next complicating factor is the sign. Now my eight by eight multiply doesn't support negative numbers. It's uh, designed only for unsigned integers and these fixed point values needed to be signed. Now, there are a couple of bits of math trick you can use to support signed numbers more directly. But one thing I've consistently found to be better is to optimize the unsigned case and then add additional code for handling the sign. If both numbers are positive, it's going to have a positive result. If one is negative, it will be negative. But if they're both negative, it will be positive. So what I actually do here is I have a quick check on the sign bits of the, input, the inputs in order to know what the sign bit of the output is going to be. Then I effectively perform an absolute modification on both, the, both of the inputs. And then at the end, I negate the value if necessary if the combined sign bits to help tell me I needed to do that. And then beneath that point everything is uh, is unsigned which makes the code uh, a lot clearer. Okay so I apologize you got uh, me on the whiteboard rather than any flashy graphics but this is an extras video. If you're one of the small number of people it seems who are actually interested in some of the, the technical detail then I hope this was uh, what you wanted. Okay cheers I'll see you again soon.